Now we're going to be talking about the electronic throttle control system components. What you're looking at now is a throttle actuator control module from a GM vehicle. We're going to be talking about external modules and systems that don't have external modules. When you have an external module, communications is going to become a critical factor and we'll be covering a very light overview of communications because it's one of the areas we have found that diagnostics have been suffering on these systems. Now the powertrain control module handles all the calculation for electronic throttle control. That means when you when we decide we want 50 percent throttle opening the PCM decides that and then either manages it or communicates it to another module. When we have a separate module we have an electronic control system module that sends separate. It handles some of the calculations and the jobs of actually running the motor, getting the feedback, and ensuring we have 50% throttle. But the PCM handles the other calculations. It says we need 50% throttle and makes those decisions. Now, how do you tell which one you've got? Well, when you see the motor hooked directly to the PCM and the throttle position sensor signals going back in, Remember, throttle position sensor signals here are feedbacks. They're not inputs. What is that difference? The position of the motor is positioned by the PCM saying it's looking for 50% throttle. We get feedback from TPS saying it's arrived at 50%. It's a feedback setting. When it, it decides where to go from accelerator pedal position. So as strange as it looks, this is what it's going to look like when you have only a PCM and no external modules. Now a throttle actuator control module handles some of the calculations when the separate module is used. These are going to do the actual positioning of the motor and the feedback from the motor. The amount of throttle opening is still going to be determined by the PCM. It's going to set the throttle opening and then this module is going to receive that communications and then run the motor, get the feedback, and position it to the requested value as established by the PCM. Now, the main processors, when we talk about these things, performs all the management tasks. It's doing all the management back and forth, whichever system you have. Why is this important? We've got to talk about it because there's two processors in here and different things show up differently. If you're dealing with a system that seems to be illogical, you know the main processor handles the calculations. If it doesn't seem to be doing the right thing with the throttle and you're having problems and all the inputs are right and all the outputs are right but this thing doesn't work right, it's the main processor. The checking processor performs a redundant checking of the sensors. Do all the TPS sensors look the same? If it looks at them, is the accelerator pedal positions doing what they should be doing? Are they all correct in reading? Are they in range? Are there performance standards? Are they doing comparative things? It does the diagnostics. Is the throttle stuck open, stuck closed? Does redundant security modeling. What this is saying is when the motorist requests 50% torque, by moving the throttle. What engine RPM does that equate to? It's certain drive, certain OE and drive, uh, torque converter locked up, all these other variables all taken into account. It's trying to model itself to know if the vehicle is doing the right thing for safety sake. It's security because if the engine looks like it's out of control and not being controlled properly, by electronic throttle control system. It has a real powerful tool. If it's a real safety issue, fuel and spark output enable comes into play. This module has the ability to disable spark and fuel if it thinks the vehicle is no longer being controlled properly by the electronic throttle control system. Now this is the most severe reaction to a failure. Whatever you do, take the time to go look at failure, 
modes because you need to understand all what they are and why it makes these decisions. But it does have the authority to do this. This is the self-check. It goes through and makes sure it can check and all the systems appear to be working normal. All this is important because electronic throttle control system can shut down spark and fuel which has a def definite effect on drivability. If it thinks something wrong, it can limit performance so the vehicle doesn't drive right, and it has the power to set trouble codes. So you need to understand all of that. The controller integrity is ensured through different self-diagnostics. Redundant computations is a comparable way of saying two processors look at the same data, they make the same computations, and see if they come up with the same answers. This is exactly the way analog brake uses its redundant calculations. It looks at it, do both processes come up with the same answers? It's a check of the system. Rationality diagnostics, power modeling, it looks at it, does this match what it expects the engine power to be, and what problems can it detect? And when it detects a problem, it will take corrective actions. Now when equipped with electronic throttle module, a separate module, it's going to interface the electronic throttle control system components and do a small amount of processing. The majority of the processing is still performed by the PCM, meaning how much throttle open do we need? It communicates that to the external module and that then the external module executes that command. Now, the external, the external throttle control module is used when adding ETC to an existing engine design, and you don't want to grind it from the ground up, change the PCM, all the control system. You want to just simply add something to it and modify some things so that you have minimum impact on the software and the wiring and the wiring harness and all the other stuff you need to totally change to a new engine design. Now, when there's a separate processor, the PCM and that processor will communicate with each other over the network's data line, and this is important. This is one of the areas that has been lacking in most people's diagnostics. If you have a diagnostic trouble code relating to communication problems, as an example, U0107, you're dealing with a communications network problem, and this is going to be important because we found this is an area where many people are making a mistake and not having sufficient diagnostics to locate the cause of the problem. You'll need to diagnose the communications problem. Now we have a complete program on that, but we want to give you a thumbnail, down and dirty, quick overview of communications, particularly for uh, this particular aspect where we're communicating with a separate module. Now here is a wiring diagram. We've highlighted one part of it. As we look at this and magnify it, we find this is going to a throttle actuator control module. There's two wires. It doesn't tell you much else, and the diagnostics say, works for a long time, don't rust. If it doesn't work, fix it. But they don't get much into it. We'll tell you a few things about this. But number one, this is the module on the firewall of the vehicle, and we're looking at the bottom down there on a lab scope pattern. And you may say, well, some people say you don't need to use a lab scope. You can do it other ways. Welcome to the club, guys. If we have a communications problem, other ways don't work. We're going to show you one way that works whether you have lost communications with all modules, which is sometimes happens, or if you've lost communications with one module. Let's talk about that signal look at it in a little more detail. Here it is. This is a Chrysler using a PCI. It's a single wire protocol that operates at 10.4. The signal is 5.5 volts. We're going to talk about some of the things that make signals normal. What is a normal signal? We're going to identify some key figures and tell you about it. First of all, anything, I don't care what bus you're on, you need to know what is recessive. You must have recessive time like this is showing here. Recessive is the quiet time. In the quiet time, it is a signal for any module looking at the network that they can start talking. 
but to start talking, they go dominant for a period of time. The width of the dominant signal determines who can talk. The one of the longest dominant wins. Then, once he gains priority, it starts communicating. This is communications. So these are the three elements. You have to have all three. We know of no way of seeing all this information without having a lab scope. We know when we see this that we have everything needed to communicate. If a module is not communicating, we have validated that this is arriving at that module. Change the module. It's checking battery power and ground. Now, GM, which happens to be the thing we just saw, is a single wire system operating from 7 to 7.5 volts. It's called Class 2 single wire, even though we saw two wires in that module. The two wires carry redundant information. Look at this. We're not saying that the voltage can be either 7 or 7.5. Seven We're saying on one car, one time, we have hard data here showing you that some of the time it's 7, some of the time it's 7.5. Probably the difference is in which module is doing the communications. Now, this is a chatterbox. Now, this will apply to any of the things we've been looking at. When we have a chatterbox, it totally shuts down communications. No one can talk. And the reason no one can talk is every module is waiting for recessive time. When it sees recessive time, it'll put up its request for priority. But we're never going to get to that point because there's never any time this is quiet. This happens to come off of a UART circuit, but it can apply to any of the systems we're talking about. It just so happens this is the one we found, and we got a lab scope pattern over chatterbox. It's a major problem when we're trying to deal with it. You can identify this with no other diagnostics other than using this method. No module can communicate. Hooking up your scan tool will not communicate. You can't get codes. You can't get any kind of communications on this bus when it's chattering like this because nothing works. If we magnify it, we see there are just constant squares. Really, you don't want to get too much because this tells us there's no available time. If we use the original one, we may be going too fast and we won't see enough information. Now, this is a Ford. It's got different dominant, different recessive, but all the elements are there. Dominant recessive, it operates on two wires, much faster rate. It runs between 4.3 and minus 4 volts. European and Asia, for diagnostics, usually ISO 9141, a single wire for diagnostic values, but it only has data for diagnostics. For their communications module to module, they use UART. UART is a commonly available, everybody uses it, P computers use it. It's a standard off-the-shelf communications protocol that's widely used in computers, printers, uh, inside modules. It's used within networks like local information networks that are used with some of the systems like CANs use UART. This is a 0 to 5 volt signal. It's got the same thing. You're going to have redominant, excessive, request for communications, priority, then you're going to have communications. This is the finest system. This is the newest. This is CAN-C or high-speed CAN. It's a two-wire protocol, uses two lab scope patterns, operates at 500 kilobods, very high speed. It hovers around 2.5 volts, both channels. Then they go dominant to 3.5 or to 1.5, depending whether the high or the low. They're mirror images of each other. Now, this is what you're going to find on your newer cars. All of these communications protocols are utilized at different times for communications in electronic throttle control. And you should be aware of it. If you want to know more about it, go look at our program specifically for communications. Now, these are the processors. Their big job is to talk to each other. That's why we spent so much time on communications. 
That is what they do. They communicate each other. Now, the other components you want to go look at are the inputs, the outputs, and the actual controllers. Make sure you look at those and the failure modes because the failure modes relate back to the processors we talked about here with redundant processors and the checking of the electronic throttle control system. 